Hello, welcome to the 15th annual David and Marilyn Knudsen Lecture. I'm Eric Hammerstrom. I'm the chair of PLU's Department of Religion. In just a moment, I will introduce our speaker who you can see with me on the screen, Tink Tinker. But first, it's right that we begin with an acknowledgement, which we read each week before chapel at PLU. In alignment with PLU's mission statement and values of critical inquiry, service, leadership, and care, it is important for those of us who call this place home and aspire to disrupt and dismantle oppression to honor and send gratitude to the first inhabitants of this land who continue to be leaders for justice in our community today. A first step is this land acknowledgement. Although we may be zooming in from many locations, we acknowledge that the PLU campus is on the traditional territory of the Nisqually, Puyallup, Squaxin Island, and Stillicum people who, prior to the Medicine Creek Treaty of 1854, which removed native people to clear way for colonial settlement, lived on and cared for this land and watershed, now known as Chambers Creek. As their ancestral home, we acknowledge that this oppression is not just a relic of the past, but is an ongoing injustice. Now, I'm happy to welcome all of you virtually to this Knudsen Lecture. My particular welcomes are extended to our speaker this evening, Reverend Dr. Tink Tinker. As an annual event organized by the Religion Department, he joins us in a lectureship that stems from the generosity and intellectual passions of Meryl and David Knudsen. They have shared their passion with us to share the best thinking in the field of religion with our PLU family and the wider community. I would also like to extend a special thanks to Marilyn for her hard work and generosity in making this lecture possible. I would also like to thank all the people who have worked hard to bring this event tonight, particularly Kendall Jeske in the Office of Congregational Engagement, <laughs> a lot of the heavy lifting behind the scenes, to Mary Duval in the Division of University Relations, and Tracy Williamson in the Division of Humanities. I would also like to thank in advance two of my colleagues in the Religion Department, Professors Merritt Trollstead and Suzanne Crawford O'Brien, who will be the moderators for the Q&A session tonight. You can, so you can use the Q&A channel at the bottom of your screen at any time to submit a question for Tink to answer. Uh, and the two of them will uh, collate those questions and ask them there, pass them along during the Q&A at the end. Uh, so please feel free to use, take advantage of that Q&A session. As I said, the Knudsen Lecture is an annual event for us. This year, the lecture is also part of Earth and Diversity Week here at PLU. During this week, our community is focusing our attention on understanding the impacts of colonialism, exploitation, and systemic oppression on minoritized communities and the environment. The guilty verdict reached today in the killing of George Floyd may provide us some hope of change but the continued killings of unarmed men, women, and children by those sworn to uphold justice are a reminder that systems of oppression remain deeply embedded within our society and in our hearts, even as we long in those same hearts for justice, for Trayvon, Brianna, Dante, Adam, Manny Ellis, and so many others. So we here in the PLU community as we grapple with racism, colonialism, and environmental destruction, we are fortunate to be able to welcome Tink Tinker to join us in the conversation. I should say that we've actually been hoping to have uh, Tink visit us for many years, uh, even before I came to PLU. Um, and we're especially grateful to have him join us as one stop of a whirlwind tour of Zoom talks he's doing uh, at Duke, Vanderbilt, Southern Methodist University, and elsewhere. Tink is a citizen of the Osage Nation, and is a distinguished thinker and leader in Native American and Lutheran communities. He earned his Master's of Divinity at Pacific Lutheran Theological Seminary and his PhD at the Graduate Theological Union. He's an ordained Lutheran minister and Professor Emeritus at Illiff School of Theology in Denver, Colorado. He has been director of the Four Winds American Indian Survival Project in Denver for decades, uh, where, he served as a, where he serves as a traditional Native American spiritual leader 
He was also past president of the Native American Theological Association and a member of the Ecumenical Association of Third World Theologians. In his scholarship, he brings his powerful and critical voice to bear on some of the issues we are grappling with. He has written, co-written, and edited half a dozen books and many articles that analyze and critique the dominant cultural and religious systems in America, and which suggest possible directions for liberative theologies for and by Native Americans. In his work, Tink draws a clear line connecting oppressive theologies and the colonial regimes that have exploited both people and the land. His words are a challenge, and they are much needed today. So I invite you to give your full attention to Tink and the words he shares with us tonight. Welcome, Tink. Thank you. Hombadali, my relatives, I wish you a, a good day and a good evening. It's my pleasure to be with the PLU uh, Zoom community uh, and, and, and to be a part of this Knudsen lecture series. As uh, Eric said, I'm a citizen of the Osage Nation. I'm also uh, a part of the uh, Eagle Clan, Gromata uh, and it's out of that place in my society that I always try to speak. 22 year, 21 years ago, after dancing for a couple of decades in, uh, with our Lakota relatives up in, in, in uh, South Dakota on the Rosebud Reservation, my brother Larry made the decision to bring the Sundance back to the Osage. So in the year 2000, for the first time in 77 years, uh, we had Sundance right there uh, on our reservation, four miles outside of uh, the uh, town of Pahuska near the village of Nilagani. Now, that Sundance is something that has fascinated a lot of white people for a long time. And particularly today, it's appealing to uh, new age folk who come in droves to experience this ceremony uh, because they want to increase their own spiritual power. They'd like to dance in that Sundance. Uh, some of the men especially want to prove their manhood. This is a test because it's a serious, serious ceremony. It's four days and four nights when it's done right of what's called a dry fast with no food and no water from midnight before you enter the dance uh, until after the fourth day after the dancers exit the center and finish the ceremony with a big feast, uh, which it turns out is pretty hard for the dancers to eat very much of after a four day fast. So these new agers see it as a test <clears throat> and as an experience. We call them sometimes spiritual scalp collectors because they, they go around collecting uh, spiritual experiences. One, one woman that was at a dance in, in South Dakota that I was a part of for many years after finishing four years of dancing in the Sundance, announced that she was not coming back the next year. She was going to use her vacation to go to Jamaica instead and experience Rastafarians. Oh, what privilege your Christian people have. They get to sample all of us and pick and choose uh, like a big supermarket of spirituality where they want to spend the rest of their lives for Indian folk. A ceremony like the Sundance, we want what cheapy, 
they call it up north, is very different. It's not an experience. It's very much a part of life. Indians don't dance in order to increase their own spiritual power. We have Yeshka interpreters who, who, who manage all of that for us. And dancing doesn't make us anything special. In fact, there's a saying that dancers use and repeat during those four days of dancing that the people might live. In other words, Indians dance not to enhance the self, but they dance for other people. They dance for all those who are standing in the shade around the, the uh, circle of the sun dance in support. They're dancing especially for the old people to bring good health and help back into the community. A dancer may dance because he or she has a, a, an aunt or an uncle who is elderly and frail and is dancing in order to give them a new source of health. For us, it is a kind of like anthropologists want to call it a renewal ceremony, but it is. We're restoring balance and harmony in the universe around us. And we restore balance and harmony in the cosmos by giving back. Not by taking, not by enhancing our own spiritual power, but by giving back. And the one thing we can give, the one thing that is in intrinsically ours is the flesh on our bodies so that we endure that suffering as a sacrifice to give back for all the blessings that will come not to me but to the people as a whole we have taken so much through the year that we need to give back This generates conversation about this topic of worldview that I've announced. Personal salvation versus cosmic balance, world balance. See, worldview is something my students struggle with because they think it must be something like an ideology and many of the more liberal, more new agey students who come to ILF want to say, oh, my worldview is exactly like the Native American worldview. And I have to slow them way down and say, well, maybe that's not true. Let's take a look at what worldview is and what, what, what you think and see whether that's really a worldview or just an ideology that you've adopted because ideologies are choices you can make. Worldview, on the other hand, is not a choice. It's something we're born into or spend decades trying to learn. Worldview is something you're born to, which means you grow up with a particular mindset, a particular way of seeing the world that comes from your, your parents, first of all, but the people around you and your community, the, the land where you live, you know, in, in this digital age from uh, all the YouTube videos that you grow up watching. It's not like deciding next week to leave the Presbyterian church and become a Baptist to leave the Lutheran church and become a Catholic, to choose to become an Episcopalian. All of that is a part of American religious freedom of choice, right? Those are ideologies that you can choose. But, but, but whether you think the way you think, that comes with 
something that's as close to you as your native language. Now think about that. I challenge my students. You cannot wake up tomorrow morning and decide from that point on, you are no longer going to speak English. You're only going to speak Mandarin. Lots of luck with that, right? Because Mandarin is one of the most difficult languages in the world to learn because you've got to learn not, not just a whole different vocabulary, different words, different syntax, but, but when you speak the words, you've got to learn to shape the words around something called tonality. So how means something very different from how? Two different words, although they might get spelled the same in English. A language that you're born into is really hard to move beyond. Even if you spend 20 years, say, in, in Guatemala learning to speak uh, Spanish and living and uh, working and, and spending all of your social time speaking Spanish, much of what you're thinking still comes in the structures that are formed by English. And Spanish is one of those Euro-Christian languages that, after all, isn't that far afield from English. So when we say, start speaking Mandarin tomorrow, uh, that's, that, that's even much more difficult. Worldview is uh, what makes you see the world the way it is in a particular way to talk about it in a particular way. Uh, think about Genesis 1 and what it says about the, uh, the human being's responsibility to the rest of creation at that moment of creation in the Genesis story. Whether you're a Christian or not, I'm suspecting you can't help but talk about the human responsibility towards creation or nature as categories separate from yourself usually as one of some kind of stewardship or caregiver. Uh, in this climate crisis, human beings must act in order to save the earth. Well, Indian people will be quick to tell you, maybe that's an overreach for humans to think they could save the earth. It might work if you all just quit trying to destroy everything around you <coughs> to use it up and consume it, to commodify it, to thingify it, to make it an object of possession, property. Uh, the elders always told us more than that. What they told us was when I was young, Grandmother Earth will take care of herself. She doesn't need you to save her. It may mean that she needs to get rid of human beings in order to survive. And that maybe you all need to pay attention to. It's not about saving the Earth, but saving human beings and saving the Earth as a habitable place for human beings that's more at stake. One of my students uh, has just published uh, a really great book on worldview. Ajay Yadidzi, Worldview Language and the Logics of Decolonization, Michigan State University Press uh, this year, 2020, uh, 20, 2021. Uh, Mark Freeland is the author. And Mark is very good at demonstrating that worldview is something very different from ideology. It's something that you're born into. So ideology is different. Being Indian is different from choosing a church denomination or a political party for that matter. Uh, or, or, and my students are surprised when I tell them 
two prominent ideologies in the Euro-Christian world are capitalism and communism. Very distinct ideologies, but the same worldview, rooted in the same way of seeing and understanding the world. Uh, and you can think about the uh, country, maybe the United States is most at odds with in the Euro-Christian sphere right now, Russia is being a, a very different culture for sure. But I assure my students, they're still Euro-Christian in their worldview, even after nearly a century uh, of, uh, of 70 years, at least, of the communist experience. The Euro-Christian worldview has a particular way of languaging things. And language is intimately related to worldview. So that uh, your Christian languages, I would argue, tend to be what, what we sometimes call noun-based languages. Whereas Indian languages are verb-based. Indian languages are about things happening about action, whereas Euro-Christian languages start with the nouns and then use verbs to put the nouns in some kind of relationship with one another. It's so distinctly prominent in one Euro-Christian language, that is in German, that they capitalize all the nouns just to make sure that you know that the nouns are the most important part of the sentence. And then because verbs are kind of an adiapha, uh, kind of an extra, they save them up and stack them all up at the end of a sentence, making German an incredibly difficult language for a lot of English speakers to learn. Well, one of the things about that nominalization, that noun-based languaging is that uh, your Christian languages tend towards two things. One, they tend towards a lot of abstractions that, that don't exist in Indian. There are even no words for them in, in, in Osage, for instance. Uh, uh, there's no word for something as simple as thing. Because all life forms are alive, have their own life, are living and moving. And just because stones uh, uh, don't seem to move very fast doesn't mean they're not moving. As Vine Delari and I keep a stone in here that I'll share with you. Uh, just because they don't move fast doesn't mean they're not alive. As Vindaloria would tell us, stones are more settled in their relationships than humans are, so they don't have to move very far. But once in a while, if you're not careful, they do move. And you all live in a part of the world like I do, where there are mountains nearby where you can see rock slides, where a whole mountainside is caved down and, and uh, stones much, much larger than this have come tumbling down uh, the side of that mountain. <clears throat> yeah, that thingification that's inherent in the word thing uh, becomes even more prominent uh, in, in the first act of the Europe Christians when they invaded this hemisphere. You see it already in Cristobal Colón, Christopher Columbus in 1492, but you see it up and down the eastern seaboard as the English and the Dutch and the French and others, Spaniards, made their way into this hemisphere. The first thing they do is baptize the land. We're next. They're going to baptize the Indians too and you know, force their conversion into Christianity. But it begins with the land because 
They want to possess the land. So they need to convert the land into property. And a Canadian scholar by the name of Anthony Hall has written a great, great book, a, a big thick tome, get ready for a long read, titled Earth into Property, talking about that conversion of the land of our grandmother, the earth into private property. So following the dictum of uh, Jean-Jacques Rousseau, who, who uh, uh, said the first person to build a fence around a piece of land and call it mine, invented civilization. Well, that's very foreign to civilizations in the Americas, to American Indians, where property land was always respected as a mother, as relationship. And there was no notion of property or private pieces of property or private lands but in fact, we all shared our relationship with the grandmother uh, and lived in respect for grandmother, lived in relationship with her, lived benefiting from the life that she generated both in us and in everything, everyone else around us. As I said earlier on, those words, creation and nature are two more abstractions that we just don't have in Indian languages until the missionaries come and they pick one. They steal one of our words, invest it with their language, and then give it back to us with this new meaning. But that's not the way our languages worked intrinsically from the beginning. Yeah. Uh, property was something we had to learn. And even today, you know, Indian reservations are not owned by any Indian nation or Indian people. They're owned by the federal government, either here in the U.S. or in Canada. They call reserves crown land because they're owned by that government. Well, the words nature and creation are typically used in order to distinguish between the human and the rest of the world. So that the students at ILF talk about spring break as a time when they can get away from the city and go live with nature for a week camping up in the Rocky Mountains. You mean nature is not at ILF School of Theology? You know, we, we have the world, the cosmos right there. That's part of nature too. I'm a part of nature. So if I'm escaping the city to go be with nature, I'm taking nature with me when I go into that, that part of, that different part of the land, that part of the world. The other, the next uh, point I want to make is that uh, the Euro-Christian worldview is inherently temporally based. That, that is, it's time oriented. That spatiality is always a subordinate category to, to, to time. So that when, when Heidegger wrote the book, Being in Time, people just laugh at me when I suggest Maybe he should have written the book Being in Place or Being in Space because you see Indians are spatial in the same way that your Christians are temporal. And, and, and I've got a daughter who's uh, doing online sixth grade right now and I've had to teach her you must be on time because it's a Euro-Christian world, a white world, and they expect temporality. So you have to be out of bed and ready to turn on your computer at 8.30 sharp. <laughs> no Indian time. Think about it in terms of uh, Euro-Christian uh, uh, religion, church services. 
This, I talk to my students about the sacred 59 minutes and 59 seconds, one day a week on Sunday morning. Uh, and if they somehow go over that 59 minutes and 59 seconds regularly, much more than a couple of minutes, their, 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 their job tenure as minister in that church is suddenly put in jeopardy. Uh, and their bishop could have them sitting in a rural church out on the state line where the bishop doesn't care uh, how long church service is because they don't contribute that much to the, uh, to, to, to the jurisdiction's monetary coffers in any case. Um, a Lutheran uh, church development person here in Denver eventually was in Chicago. Uh, Dick Magnus, maybe some of you know that name from his time as uh, uh, director of, uh, uh, of congregational uh, development in, in, in Chicago, told me there are three criteria that they paid attention to when they were looking for a new place to uh, build a piece of uh, your church. And it sounds spatial, but it's not spatial. The three criteria are location, location, and location. He didn't mean a really powerful piece of land where you can talk to the Wanagi, the ancestral spirits, and be in relationship with them. No, he meant in a place that is economically viable, where the congregation is liable to attract uh, enough adherence uh, to make to make the congregation a thriving uh, church industry. So that temporality of the Euro-Christian worldview comes across in concepts of progress, of development, of economic notions of development, not sp just spiritual but it's across the board in all aspects of life. Spirituality and the temporal movement towards salvation in heaven. So someone dies, oh, she's with Jesus now. But, but before a new business venture can raise the capital they need to, you know, to develop their business, they have to have a plan, a temporal plan that shows how the business is going to recoup the money invested and pay it back uh, with, 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 a, uh, with the extra that investors come to expect from their investment. So the European worldview deals with thingification, with nominalization and abstraction, with temporality. And, and the next one I want to add is individualism. That's the point of the title, World Balance versus Personal Salvation. Yeah, it's that individual salvation, individualism, which takes over all of the Euro-Christian world shortly after uh, the, 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 the Black Plague. That's my uh, theory in any case, you know, fo following the Black Plague years of 1348 to 1352 and lead directly into the Renaissance where for the first time you have artists who are signing their works, painting signed by the painter, music signed by the composer, etc. Uh, and that individualism then becomes part and parcel of the worldview from then on, and it's really hard to shake loose of it. Uh, and, and even my new age students come to understand that they haven't gotten rid of uh, individualism by adopting a new age ideology. They, they may have made a, taken a step towards something that seems like Native Americans, but in fact, they, they, they've just engaged in a 
different kind of Christianity without Jesus. It's still salvation empowerment, spiritual empowerment of the individual. For the Indian worldview, everything is interrelationship. We're related to everyone else. And by everyone else, remember I said we don't have a word for thing. So this stone is my relative. The tree outside my window, a nice maple tree, is my relative. The flowers, the trees, the bushes, the birds, both the eagles and the sparrows and everything in between, the hummingbirds, the squirrels and the buffaloes, those are all relatives. They're not just things. They're not its. In fact, there's another word. Uh, Osage doesn't have a word for it. In fact, we don't distinguish between he and she either. Uh, we, we use the same pronouns for, for male and female both. Uh, so interrelationship is incredibly important. So that when I sing my morning song, and I can sing now because I've had surgery on my vocal cords, it's I greet the morning star, the new day, and then embrace all living creatures uh, at that moment. Every day, that's who we are. I was asked to speak to a, 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 a conference at Marquette University years ago on non, the topic was nonviolence in world religions. And I told them I can't do that because uh, American Indians are not nonviolent. We have too many relatives okay? and we have to eat lunch. And that means we have to eat some of our relatives, commit acts of violence at mealtime just to survive. But we're really careful. My daughter's learned this since she moved in. And she's very helpful. We have a plate that we set aside for the Wanagi, those, all those Wanagi relatives and ancestors. We put a little food aside for them of everything that we eat so that we're restoring balance even as we eat and commit acts of violence. Because the question isn't being nonviolent. The question is, how do you mitigate the violence that we necessarily engage in in order to live? on this earth. I said we're spatial already. Everything is about locality. Our ceremonies are spatial. For us, the ceremony has to follow the direction out of directions of the, uh, of the four winds. So that Sundance, when we built that altar, the dancers come in the east gate with the rising sun and go out the east gate as the sun sets. And there are four other gates that they pay attention to during the day. The same with Iungli, that, that ceremony sitting with stones that, that my white relatives uh, love to call sweat lodge because they sweat profusely when they come in there. At sitting with the stones, you know, the door has to open in a particular direction. We sit in a circle around the stone pit, bring them in in a very special way. Uh, and, and it depends on the ceremony or it depends on the clan, if you're Osage, whether the door is to the east or to the west, but it's one or the other. And today, in terms of spatiality, you'll hear indigenous voices from uh, Tacoma all the way to the Everglades, from San Diego 
all the way to Maine and all across Canada as well, yelling, land back, because they want their spatiality returned to them. But I, I had to explain on Facebook, Indians are not asking for property rights. They're asking for their relationship to the earth to be restored, our cultures to be restored, our languages, and everything else that comes with our relationship to the mother land back. We're also very community structured as opposed to your Christian individualism. I know your Christians talk about community all the time. I left was constantly for the 33 years I taught there talking about building community. Well, if you have to build community, it's not a part of the worldview. It's not immediately there. It's an ideology you have to instill in people. In order, and and we, we did it at ILF by building a special lounge for students eventually, giving them a place to hang out and be together, doing little things to make community possible for them. Having a weekly chapel service was part of that. But those are all part of developing an ideology for Indian people, the community is built in. It's a birth community. We're, we're a part of that community because of a birthright, not because we have joined. In fact, you can't join an Indian nation. You have to be born into it. Oh, sure, especially today, with 500 years of colonialism, Indian people are fond of adopting their six best white friends and making them Indian, giving them Indian names. But, but that's not the same as being a part of a community. Because if I adopt a white friend, I haven't vetted that with the nation back in Pahuska, Oklahoma. I, I, I haven't immediately imposed that relationship on all Osages, I can't do that. I can't do that. Uh, yep, we are a community. And we have ceremonies that are community ceremonies that involve the whole of a community. And in fact, in the old day, the communities, the major uh, ceremonies were always whole community ceremonies involving uh, key, uh, uh, key players, key actors from each of the 24 clans. And if one clan was missing, the ceremony could not be conducted. Uh, is that serious a business? And, and so when I look at uh, uh, some of our key ceremonies, it's impossible to tell who's actually in charge because we don't have an in charge. In fact, we're all down here in a collateral egalitarian relationship with one another. It's about balance and harmony. It's not about that up down image schema, that hierarchy that your Christians automatically have and think about automatically think in terms of a higher power. Have to really struggle with Buddhism to think in terms of a non-theistic way of looking at the world. And, and, and had to force Indians to adopt a higher power. And had to steal one of our words in order to name that higher power. So for Osages, the word was Wakonda. Wakonda became the word for the Christian God. Destroyed a perfectly wonderful, powerful word that we can't use in the old way anymore because it means God. That fast, a hierarchy up, down. And in that hierarchy, God's on top. And then you have these layers of authority 
whether it's a CEO in business, a CFO, and then uh, uh, executive management and middle management. And below that, you have the workers, right? Or you have a governor of a state, a legislature and judiciary, and eventually the people in the precincts who actually vote for the more or less wealthy people. And in the US Congress, I was told a couple of years ago that all members of the US Congress are millionaires. You have to have money to be one of those people in a democracy who gets to make decisions for people like you and me who don't have that kind of money, uh, who, who get to make decisions typically historically under colonialism for American Indians. <clears throat> we could talk about more of this in different ways. We could talk about the lack of good and evil in the Indian world. I mean, talk about up and down and a hierarchy. Good is up here and evil is down below, right? God's in heaven, devil's in uh, the underground, right? That doesn't work for Indians traditionally because the way I was taught by my uncle Sylvester Tinker, the, then the principal chief of the Osage Nation, was when I when I talk, I should call in the Wanagi by calling Wakanda Monshita from above and Wakanda Utseta from below. Grandfather and grandmother. Harmony and balance. Once again, we have a reciprocal dualism, not an oppositional dualism of good versus evil. <coughs> in fact, in Osage, the word that captures the worst thing you can say about anybody is BG. BG. It's what I say to my dog, my daughter's dog when she wanders off the sidewalk into a neighbor's front garden area. Bishi Songe. Bad dog. Bad dog. You know, your uncle died. Oh, Bishi, that's really bad. Uh, your house got robbed? Bishi. And you had a bad day? That's Bishi too. Or you don't feel good, you feel bad, you can use BG that way too. You see, there is no category of abstract evil around which we have to wrestle and grapple with. There's no personification of evil to make that abstraction somehow easier to grasp in a figure like Satan or, or Diabolus. Uh, see, for us, it's about harmony and balance. We're constantly restoring harmony and balance, whether it's in that Sundance that we do in Nilagani, or whether it's uh, uh, setting a little food out for the Lanagi when we eat a family meal, yep, or whether, whether it's talking to the Lanagi and realizing the Lanagi are above us and below us and around us in the four directions, so that I would summon them. I call you from the four directions to be here with us. And grandfather from above, grandmother from below. We need both having just a grandfather or in terms of some feminist theology, just a grandmother is not good enough. You have to have both to have harmony and balance. That's uh, my thought for all of you this day is that harmony and balance may become part of your world. You can't adopt it as a worldview, but you can begin to think about it as an ideology because worldviews do change over time. 
but you can't change a worldview. It has to be the whole community that changes a worldview. You can start it by adopting a different ideology and talking about that ideology, talking about it with your kids. Uh, individualism didn't happen overnight. It's going to take at least that long to get rid of that radical Euro-Christian individualism. And it's been, what, since uh, I said 1348 to 52, uh, some uh, seven, 800 years almost uh, since that began. So it takes time. If we're going to fix the world, it's going to take time. It's not going to happen overnight. And we can be in conversation about it. And I invite you to be in conversation with traditional Indian people and invite you to be in conversation with me as well. Kakuna, we don't de I think I've taken the time I need to uh, lay out some ideas, and uh, that'll give us uh, a good period of time to engage in some uh, uh, Q&A. Thank you so much, Tink, for this talk and for your time. We've been monitoring the Q&A and there's a lot of wonderful questions that folks have shared and that students have shared. Um, and so we, will, we won't possibly be able to get to all of them, but we will, we will definitely ask as many as we can um, in the time we're allowed. So I think the first, one of the first questions that came through was um, from, this is uh, quoting, quoting someone here, from your discussion, I would label Christianity in a sense distinct from Euro-Christianity as an ideology more than a worldview, though choosing and immersing oneself in an ideology may eventually shift a worldview. Anyway, my question is, can you help illuminate how the concepts of worldview and ideology help understand 21st century syncretism or blending between American Indian traditions and Christianity among indigenous people? Oh, there's a lot there, man. Yeah. My. I don't call Christianity a worldview at all. Your Christianity for me is a sociological category. It, it, it is intertwined with Christianity. That, that, that's where your Christianity was born, is in the, the Christian people of Europe over, over the last 2,000 years. But I need a way to talk about who y'all are without saying white people, because the color code for me is an empty cipher, even though y'all invented it, right? <laughs> uh, uh, about 400 years ago. Uh, the, the color code doesn't quite work. Uh, so there's got to be a more precise way. This is the uh, critical scholar in me to talk about, uh, uh, about white people. And, and I choose, and I've written an essay about it, Euro Christians. The essay is titled, you can find it, it's online. What are we going to do with white people? Uh, Yeah, we live in a world where everything's becoming jumbled. I don't find that necessarily positive. I critique my Chicano friends and uh, the woman that started their ideological thinking, uh, Gloria Anseldua, talking about Nepantla, borderlands, in between inter interstitial spaces. And, and, and I think that concedes too much to colonialism. Uh, and, and, and Indians who try to hold the gospel together with some semblance, what's left of the wreck of their traditional uh, worldview, again, are conceding too much to, uh, to, to colonialism. Uh, and I, I went through that. 
you all see on, on, on the, the page you all publicized my coming to PLU that I was even ordained a Lutheran minister. Uh, and when I retired from Iliff, the bishop here in Denver called me, really a wonderful man, Jim Hitchon. Uh, and Jim said, Tink, you're retired. I'm preparing the clergy roster for next year. It seems to us that you haven't been very active as a Lutheran and maybe you don't want to even be listed as Lutheran clergy. I said, Jim, that's all I got to hold your feet to the fire. So yeah, you've listed me this long. You may as well continue. I said, good, I'll list you as retired. <laughs> uh, yeah, I did that. And I tried to do it for Indian people. And I realized even I, having written the book Missionary Conquest, was doing what I criticized the missionaries for doing. I was selling them a bill of goods. I was selling them an up-down hierarchy. Instead of realizing we don't have an up-down hierarchy, we have a collateral egalitarian world where we're all on the same level, even the Wanagi are with us on this level, even if they come through a portal from the Wanagi world. They're not above us, superior to us. They just have certain energies that enable them to do things we can't do on this side. So I, I, I am trying to encourage Indian people, go back and reclaim what's yours. It's time to do that. I have another question for you, Tink. Um, here, I'll read it exactly as they wrote it. Uh, Given the indigenous understanding of balance instead of good and evil, it kind of goes along with what uh, you were just talking about. So given the indigenous understanding of balance instead of good and evil, what might the indigenous perspective be when faced with communities or individuals committing great atrocities against other humans and the earth? Is it possible to rehabilitate every relative on earth or are there some relationships which are too destroyed to be saved? Yeah, there are some administrations in Washington that challenge my denial of good and evil more than others, right? Uh, just bizarre stuff that people can say and do. Uh, I've got to be uh, comfortable with letting them burn themselves out instead of confronting them as evil. See, U.S. foreign policy, to, to pick a Euro-Christian institution that cannot get over its rootedness in Christianity, is so devoted to the notion of good versus evil that it's a part of every foreign policy cooked up in Washington, Republican or Democrat. It was the communists who were evil through my growing up. And now, of course, it's the Muslims who are evil. And they're quickly being replaced by the Chinese as evil. There's got to be an evil, and the U.S. must be the good, right? The U.S. are the good. They're, they're the good guys. I mean, it's true even in killing Indians. It's there in every Western, right? Every John Wayne movie. The white guys are the good guys. They wear the white hats or the Calvary blue jackets on horseback. Uh, and the Indians had it coming to, you know, you can imagine U.S. goodness all day long. And there are presses like Fox News and Breitbart that are absolutely dedicated to contributing to that imaginary of the U.S. is good. They call it U.S. exceptionalism, right? It was called the Monroe Doctrine a hundred years ago. 
and before that, the, the Puritans called it the city on a hill because they conceived of the U.S. as you know, not the U.S. then, but America, the land they were coming to as the new Israel, the new Jerusalem, uh, the new chosen people of God. Well, at some point, that only goes away when you get rid of the notion of evil that it's combating and coming up against. So instead of thinking of evil, let's think about being in harmony and balance with one another. Yeah, I know that doesn't, that doesn't slow down all the narcissists in the world, but if we do it long enough, maybe there'll be less narcissists around. Go ahead and read another question that's come in. Um, you talked about Grandmother Earth being able to save herself, and that might look like killing humans to protect herself. What is our role in that relationship? Do we have a role? How do we save those of us who are unequally afflicted through the effects of capitalism, colonialism, etc., that creates global warming? Sure. And Indian people suffer in this climate crisis more than anyone else. It's our water that's being threatened by Dakota Access Pipeline, right? Uh, it, it's Indian people who have been given the most barren places to live in North America. When, when the whole of the land was ours to enjoy and live on. Uh, so, so we live in places now where, uh, to pick up on a Joe Biden term, where there is no infrastructure. We can't have industry on reservations because there are no, no highways or railroads nearby to ship whatever Indians might manufacture. Uh, at the same time, I'd have to say that Indians are less afraid than other people of, of uh, just passing into the Wanagi world. Uh, it seems to me curious that so many Euro-Christian liberal uh, uh, climate emergency people, people who are out to, to save the environment, environmental justice people, are really about saving human beings, saving the planet as habitation for human beings. We need, we, maybe we need to hear them say that more clearly. I'm not against doing that. I am for not obliterating any species uh, from the face of the earth. I, I'd like to see the American West open up to uh, millions of buffalo once again. Uh, they deserve to have this earth too. It's theirs as much as it is uh, mine as an, as an American Indian. And every Indian reservation in the West seems to have a buffalo herd, but it's all fenced in. For better or for worse. Next question. Yeah, I have. Um, all right, here it is. Um, is hierarchy always wrong? Can there be hierarchical organizations of power while individuals simultaneously move through the world with a collateral egalitarian view? What would a hierarchy with collateral egalitarian worldviews look like if it's even possible? I think it's a great question. You all need to wrestle with that for the next 20 years. Uh, I actually spoke to a group of Lutheran theologians 
who are doing a theology of echo justice. Oh, that had to be 10 years ago because uh, my daughter wasn't with me yet. I date everything around her moving in. <laughs> uh, at Trinity Seminary in Columbus, Ohio. And they thought they had me. But Tink, you all had chiefs. Well, we didn't have chiefs. Uh, that's the word you all use to describe these people. Uh, they're called Gallega. And actually, you're right. Uh, but we're twice as good as you because we had two Gallega in every village. One on the Earth Division side and the other across the street on the Sky Division side. And they took turns every other day being in charge, kind of like having Donald Trump on Mondays and Hillary Clinton on Tuesdays. Now, if you can wrap your mind around that, you begin to understand what I mean by collateral egalitarian. The Gaega never had authoritarian power. Their only job is to reflect back the consensus of the communal whole. And if they stop reflecting back the consensus, they're pretty quickly out of a job and they know that. Uh, can there be a hierarchy in the in-between? Y'all have to figure that out because it's your world. Unfortunately, especially since 1934 and the Indian Reorganization Act, every Indian reservation is governed by an up-down image schema. So the Osage Nation has, we have a brand new constitution 10 years, 15 years ago. We have a principal chief, an assistant principal chief, a national Congress and a national judiciary. What does that look like for God's sake? That's the US government in miniature. You and a camel, not bicameral. And in virtually every Indian reservation is governed that way. The US government intentionally got rid of all the traditional ways of self-governance of Indian peoples so that they could better control uh, that people. And giving us democracy where Indian people can, just like Americans generally, confuse democracy with voting means that uh, we fall into line as just another uh, corrupt miniature local government. Another question will take us in a slightly different direction. Um, what advice would you give to students entering divinity school as they hope to dive deeper into their own religion as well as learn about other religions? Would you say there should be a similar balance or harmony in learning about ministering to both or multiple communities? I'd say you need to start by reading a piece I wrote uh, I think it was published at the beginning of this year. Maybe it was published last year in the journal on uh, uh, religious and cultural theory. It's online. So just look up Tink Tinker and Religious Studies. The title of it is Religious Studies, The Final Colonization of American Indians. That's another one of those uh, obscure abstractions that we don't have a word for in Osage. You have a PhD in it, Suzanne, religion, religious studies. Lots of luck with that. I mean, I, I've, I've taught a PhD theory course titled 
theories and methods in religious studies. I know there ain't anybody in the literature who can define the word religion. Uh, the, the, the one person who maybe for me comes closest is David Chittister in his book, Empire of Religion. <laughs> He's a Santa Barbara guy too. Um, yeah, that, that religion was invented essentially by Max Muller and gang uh, at the heart of empire in, 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 uh, in, in England in the 1880s. <clears throat> as a way of controlling the colonies. And they did it by uh, vociferously uh, consuming all the misinformation that came in from, uh, from colonial administrators and missionaries from, from uh, uh, of course, Chittis just writing more about Southern Africa. Um, but it, it works the same way with information coming from India or coming from uh, American Indian communities in the U.S. Uh, we don't have a word for religion. We do what we do. It's how we live. It's part of our worldview. We don't have a word for it. We do it because we're verbal and not nominal. You all are nominal. You need to name what we do, and you can't. Not accurately. Not, not, not to any with any great deal of, uh, of satisfaction and, and, and surety. Uh, I, I wrote an essay in response to an obscene essay by the president of Union Seminary trying to uh, apply his neo-orthodox theology to, uh, to being more pluralistic being more accepting of other people's religion. Essentially, I didn't use these words exactly. I said, uh, we don't give a goddamn if you accept our, us in your theology or not. It just has nothing to do with us. What would help us is if you quit preaching this Jesus you talk about and just be that Jesus, act the way Jesus acted, and, and, and quit, can you imagine the Jesus of the Gospels saying yes to a $700 billion budget line funding the Pentagon and new weapon systems? I'm sorry, but, but that's just, uh, that, that's the Republican Jesus. That's not the classic Jesus. <laughs> well, I may have a question that kind of builds on that um, theme uh, that came in. And uh, this question was, are there any resources within the Euro-Christian traditions that you can think can contribute to the decolonization or de-imperialization of the Euro-Christian mind? You know, it's hard because Christian theologians live in that worldview. That's what makes it difficult. Uh, you know, I did write that essay 30 years ago now on the Gospel of Mark, arguing that, uh, that, that Mark is spatial and not temporal going against every New Testament Greek scholar in, in the world at the time, in the U.S. anyway, who assured me that that's not true. And I think I made the case pretty clearly that, that the kingdom of God is spatial from Mark and not temporal. It's going to take that kind of really critical energy in doing... Greek New Testament uh, to come up with a wholly different theological perspective, a whole different ideology about how Christianity works and should work. 
you know, I think the, the two things. I think there's a lot of creative stuff going on. I don't read it because I don't have time. Uh, but I think there's a lot of creative stuff going on. Sally McFaig just passed away, and her her work was was uh, was was really good. But but it's still that up down image schema. She never moved beyond that. Just reimagining uh, 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 the Euro Christian God. Uh, But all of you, theologians like Matt, uh, uh, others need to be in conversation with Indian people. Because uh, I don't think you're going to get there by yourselves. To reimagine so radically, you've got to have some discussion partners. And I'm saying not Christian Indians, but traditional Indians who speak the, the old, the traditional language, the old language, not the new uh, uh, churchified version of their language, but the old language. Be in conversation with them and find all kinds of different ways to tweak your own ideological thinking about theology. Got a question that maybe builds on this nicely. Um, one person asked, are you suggesting traditional indigenous beliefs are closely aligned, recognizing that's a loaded word, with Buddhism? So you had mentioned- Not Buddhism. at all. No. no. Two, two different ideologies, two different ways of, uh, but, but I suppose we have a way of talking to one another that uh, is easier than, than a Euro Christian talking with a Buddhist. It's my supposition. We'd have to ask Eric about that, I guess. Uh, no, I, I uh, had a Buddhist colleague when I first was at Ilaf, uh, where he's down in Santa Barbara now, uh, Jose Cabezon, who had been uh, with the Dalai Lama uh, in India for for a long period of time as a, as a monk. And Jose would explain every year during an introductory course where he and I got to be together for one session. And he would explain that he's a Buddhist because uh, that he's a uh, vegetarian because in his Buddhist sect, uh, they didn't want to hurt any sentient being. And he did this faithfully every year because he knew what was coming from me. Uh, and my role was to stand up and say, Jose, what is it about corn that leads you to think corn is not sentient? Because corn's one of our mothers, one of the three sisters, corn, beans, and squash. And of course, corn is sentient. And that's why we can't eat lunch or in my case, breakfast, w w without mitigating the violence that we do to our corn mother. We have to make that relationship right again, even though there are origin stories that explain how corn mother sacrificed herself to feed her children. But I can't recklessly eat corn I must remember, this is also my mother that comes from grandmother, the earth. I have, um, we have, probably have time for this, probably a question or two more and we don't wanna tire you out too much either. You've been so gracious. Um, Oops, and now I can't even see my questions. One moment, okay, here it is. Um, in what ways are American Indian values of balance and harmony different from, quote, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, uh, unquote? In other words, would a collateral egalitarian worldview committed to balance and harmony argue that violence cannot be met with violence in order to achieve balance, harmony, and peace 
how do American Indian communities cope with feelings of resentment, desire for retribution, and other anger and hurt-fueled experiences of suffering? Some of that has to do with early, early socialization, how babies are brought up. Uh, you see people like Lacan and other psychologists devote a great deal of their psychological musings and writings to issues of individuation, how a child individuates. But that's not the Indian question about a child. The child is loved and cared for. The child is never hit. Uh, But, but it's not individuated the way your Christian children are individuated. Sure, they grow up learning that they are a person, a self, that they have certain gifts that uh, aren't the same as other kids' gifts. Some are better, some are less good than other kids. But there's a place for everyone in the community. So the, 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 they don't have jealousy as a role model to turn to. So it's, it's, it, it's, I'm not saying it doesn't happen, but it doesn't happen the way it happens in your Christian cultures. It uh, doesn't happen the way it happens in the city around us. Uh, maybe it does more and more today as more and more Indian kids have come through uh, uh, schools taught by the nuns uh, or, or, uh, or you know, other Protestant schools. Uh, my daughter's taught kids she's having problems with, have the same right to live, the same right to enjoy the earth as she does. And she's got to figure out a way to let them do that, even if they're doing it in a way that irritates the heck out of her. And a lot of them do, and some of them probably need a grandparent to sit down with them and say, hey, granddaughter, grandson, come here. Uh, we've got to talk this through because it's more and more complex these days, especially Indians living in the city. Uh, so I'm not saying the world was perfect, but the socialization was different. And it's that difference in socialization that, that, that meant that uh, kids didn't grow up with the same kinds of jealousies or the same amounts of jealousies. And of course, in terms of having things, that's all different today. Uh, you know, who's got the newest PS2 or the newest Nintendo Switch or you know the newest iPad? Uh, uh, you know it's become even worse as kids have more and more electronic toys, expensive ones, uh, to show off their individual self. Whereas we had in a village. Pretty much the same stuff. Maybe my beadwork was better because my mom did better beadwork. I can be proud of that, but it's just beadwork. Uh, and if that kid over there is jealous of my beadwork, he or she can learn to do beadwork for themselves and do better. I think I have what what will be a nice final question for us. Um, I think this reads like a good takeaway. Uh, thank you for your words. You have invited us to be in dialogue. 
how we meet, how may we continue this dialogue after this presentation? Well, uh, it depends on where you are. Uh, if you're in Tacoma, there are a dozen Indian nations around you that, that you can go to to learn from. Pick one of them. Uh, immerse yourself. If they if they befriend you, immerse yourself. Talk to them. Listen. Don't go in with questions. Questions are no no, because when you ask questions, you're shaping the answer already. Uh, I've got a funny story about that, but we don't have time for it. Read. Read my stuff. Read uh, uh, Barbara Alice Mann, Iroquoian Women. Everything else she's written too, but especially Iroquoian Women. And there are countless Indian authors now who are writing. Uh, Leanne Beresamasoke Simpson is one of the hottest uh, new Indian writers on the market and worth the time to read. Robin Wall Kimmer is another one. She just writes some really lovely, she's a lovely writer. She, she's maybe not as deeply steeped as Leanne is in her culture, but she's struggling with it and trying to. Uh, she's a university biologist. <laughs> uh, dozens of others that you can read. And don't, don't limit yourself to American Indian. Uh, look at uh, uh, Linda Tehiwai Smith's book on decolonizing methodology. Critically important book written about 20 years ago. She's Maori from Aotearoa. So there are Maori writers, there are Aboriginal writers in Australia, uh, writers, uh, uh, native writers in, in uh, Latin America. I would say, I would say that's really the way to go is is before you engage people in conversation or do it on two tracks one reading stuff in, in order to get to know more deeply what people are saying i've written about a hundred don't read my books they're old i've written about a hundred uh articles and 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 book chapters in books those are more cutting edge some of them are online read them I sent some of them to, uh, uh, to Merritt. Uh, I think I sent you copies, right? Files? Not just a list, but the actual files. Yes. We can't thank you enough, um, Tink, for joining us tonight and for um, listening to the questions and responding to our questions. Um, this evening. And um, I noticed that someone says, can you please make this reading list available after in the chat uh, or in the questions? Um, and um, I can, I can do that. Uh, the titles that you had shared with me. Yes. Uh, yeah. Uh, people are asking about uh, Mark Freeland's book. Uh huh. Is that out of the light enough? Yeah, it is. It is. Thank you. And we were, we were, um, uh, Tank had, had graciously offered to close us out this evening. So we're about at least 200 people gathered here um, in this um, space and time, time together <laughs> in various spaces <laughs> all over. Um, 
and various times, quite frankly. <laughs> We're even in three different time zones, the three of us <laughs> right now. <laughs> um, but we're in a sort of space together. Um, that's really late for you. Yeah, that's right. Would you lead us in um, uh, sending sending us out uh, into the rest sure. of the evening? Sure. Thank you. Uh, we'll call it the end. Let, let me say thank you to Marilyn Knudsen. Uh, for this lecture series and for a lovely conversation she and I had this morning. Uh, and she's even promised to uh, uh, cook a Swedish breakfast for me if I come to Tacoma. So y'all have to invite me back so I can hold her to her word. <laughs> and I, she, she told me I could bring my daughter and or my wife. So. Uh, I suspect uh, if I come back, if you invite me back, I'm bringing my daughter for sure. She's my travel companion. <laughs> I invited the Wanagi in from the four directions. Uh, the sacred one from above and below grandfather and grandmother. Uh, the sky and earth. And I'll call them again to send them back into the four directions that they came from. There was one of those Wanagi who came. It's actually in my bedroom last night. I heard him. His stomach was growling. Uh, my, my wife and daughter when I got COVID moved to the basement and uh, they, they haven't made their way back upstairs yet. So the dog stays with them in the basement. And, and when the dog pulled out, the Shomikathi Sapi decided to curl up at the foot of my bed. And so I, I hear him snorting through the night hers stomach will growl or he'll chew on something. Uh, he was there last night. So I, I, I've got to thank Shomi Kathi Sabi for being here because he knew I was having trouble sleeping thinking about this talk today uh, and thinking about what I was going to say and I only said half of what I had uh, sketched out in my notes. So Shome Kathi Sabi is a black coyote. The only black coyote I had seen when I first met him. I've seen a couple since then. Uh, but thank you, Shome Kathi Sabi, for being here with me and touching my heart and my tongue. And may uh, you touch the, the heart and the minds of, uh, of those who have listened to me this day. Uh, to the Eagle Nations, to the Eagle Nation and, and three grandparents from that nation in particular, I want to say thank you. Kamimelaska, Honka Dompa, and Hulaton for being here with us because they're part of what gives me the energy to say what I need to say. But, but they want me to be sure to tell you any mistakes I make are mine and not theirs. <laughs> so, Wakanda Monchita, Ski Wakanda would say that that's a topi Wakanda Gi. You've come to us from the four directions. I say thank you for being here. Now go out in the four directions and touch the hearts and minds of all those who are in at least three different time zones who are a part of this uh, this lecture series tonight. Kakuna blinde we ach no. We do it on the kire thani. And you can ask for a translation, but I wasn't talking to you. <laughs>